This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And if you ask me, the best way to listen to that story is to do it with a glass of port wine right handy. Petri California port. No kidding, that Petri port is just swell for any time good friends get together to talk things over. You couldn't ask for a more delicious wine. Why, just looking at the deep, rich red color of that Petri port tells you that here's a wine with a flavor that comes right from the heart of sun-ripened grapes. If you haven't ever tried Petri port, why not get a bottle and have a glass after dinner tomorrow night? It's the perfect after-dinner wine, you know. And share that port with your family and your friends. Don't forget, when you serve Petri Port, you can serve it proudly. Because, after all, the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now let's keep our weekly appointment. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Draw up a chair. Thanks. That's it. By the way, do you know what date it is? Um... November 5th, isn't it? That's quite correct. In England, it's known as Guy Fawkes Day. Ever heard of it? It's something to do with a gunpowder plot, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Bartell, it is. And as Sherlock Holmes and I had a very unusual adventure on the 5th of November many years ago, it seems appropriate that I should tell you about it tonight. But before I begin, I think I might help you to appreciate the true flavor of the story So I tell you a little about the origin and customs of a Guy Fawkes Day. It's a swell idea, Dr. Watson. Well, my boy, on November the 5th, 1605, exactly 340 years ago today, King James I was about to attend the opening of Parliament when a plot was discovered to blow up the House of Lords during the ceremony. And the chief conspirator was Guy Fawkes, I suppose? Yes, he was. He was captured in a vault immediately below the House of Lords, a vault full of barrels and gunpowder. Of course, he and his fellow conspirators were executed. And ever since then, November the 5th has been known as Guy Fawkes Day. Well, uh, how's it celebrated, Doctor? Well, it's a great time for the youngsters, Mr. Bartell. They black their faces, throng the streets begging for pennies, and build bonfires in which to burn effigies of Guy Fawkes. These effigies are life-sized dummies stuffed with straw and dressed in old clothes. The children parade chanting rhymes. Now, let me see. Uh, oh, yes. Please to remember the 5th of November. Guy Fox Guy, hit him in the eye. <laughs> the kids must have quite a time. Uh, sort of like Halloween, huh, Doctor? Oh, not at all unlike it, my boy. Well, now that I've told you something about the customs of Guy Fox Day, I'll get on with my story. It began just before lunch, I remember, on November the 5th, 1899. The day was foggy and cold, and Holmes and I were seated each side of a blazing fire in our Baker Street room. From outside... We could hear the sound of voices laughing and singing. Suddenly Holmes rose and crossed to the window, opened it, and looked out. Then he turned to me and spoke. Children are having a great time, Watson, aren't they? Yes, it's supposed to be sitting to have a penis to walk here this morning. Has it occurred to you, Watson, that the gunpowder plot of her... Offers very promising material to the speculative mind. One way, Holmes. I say it's confoundedly chilly in here. Do you think you might close that window? I'm sorry, old chap. As I was saying, the gunpowder plot offers very promising material to the speculative mind. I've made something of a study of the historical records of the case. There's more than little evidence to suggest that King James was never in any real danger. Never in any danger? What makes you say that? Knowledge of the proposed dastardly scheme came to light early. But James Stuart, King of England, the possessor of a shrewd and diabolical mind, used the spectacular discovery of the plot to try and bolster his waning popularity as well as to justify increased religious persecution. That's the first I ever heard of it, Holmes. I dare say, old fellow, but it's true just the same. I'm afraid James Stuart, King of England, was an unscrupulous tyrant. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? There is a gentleman to see you, Mr. Holmes. He says it's very important. I asked him to give you his time. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. 
<laughs> Ask him to come up, will you please? I, sir. Who, who is it, um? A gentleman with a remarkably fine sense of timing. Read his card to yourself. James Stewart. Great Scott, that's an extraordinary coincidence that he should arrive just as we're talking about James Stewart, King of England. Come in. Mr. James Stewart. How do you do, Mr. Stewart? My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Mr. Holmes, you've got to help me. I'm walking about in mortal fear of my life. You've got to help now, me. Mr. Stewart, I suggest that you sit down. I'll do anything in my power to help you, but uh, you must compose yourself first and tell me quietly what it is that's frightening you. How can I compose myself when I may be dead within a few hours? Now, now, Mr. Stewart, I'm a doctor. I really think that I give you a sedative, you would find... How can you talk of sedatives when I... <laughs> my heart... Doctor, my heart. All right, it's all right. Now, here, let me, let me help you onto this sofa. That's it. I imagine the brandy will be in order, Watson. Yes, Holmes, and I'll give him some digitalis. A fellow with a bad heart like this shouldn't allow himself to get so excited. Here you are, Mr. Stewart. Drink this. Uh, that's it, that's it, that's it. And now this, Mr. Stewart. What is it? It's digitalis. Very well. You feel better, sir? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Yes, I do. Uh, you're right. I shouldn't get so excited. My heart can't stand it, you know. Watson, is he well enough to talk to you? Yes, if he doesn't excite himself again. I'll, I'll be careful, Doctor. I'll take it quietly. Uh, Mr. Holmes, when you saw my card just now, did it strike any responsive call? Oh, naturally, it did, sir. Who could fail to be intrigued when a James Stewart calls to see one on Guy Fawkes Day? Uh, it isn't just coincidence that my name is James Stewart. I've got royal blood in my veins. People know of it. And that's another reason they're out to kill me. Uh, they're jealous of my heritage. Every instinct I have is a royal one. Now, you gentlemen know that falconry is a king's sport. And my greatest hobby is the breeding and training Mr. of falcons. Stewart, please, Mr. Stewart, owing to the state of your health, I suggest that you will be more economical with your explanation. In fact, I think it might be better if I question you. Uh, very well, Mr. Holmes. Now, you say that your life is in danger. What evidence do you have to substantiate that claim? Uh, my cousin Guy Falkenby has threatened it. Uh, you see, Mr. Holmes, he and I are the only heirs to a wealthy uncle. His fortune will go to the surviving heir. If I were dead, Guy would inherit everything. It seems to me, Mr. Stewart, that you should have applied to Scotland Yard for protection. I did, Dr. Watson. Only a few days ago, I saw a certain inspector, Lestrade, I think his name was, and, and he laughed at my fears. Lestrade, eh? <laughs> and he laughed at it. Then in that case, there may be something in your story, sir. <laughs> you say that your cousin has threatened to kill you. Has he indicated the method he intends to employ? Aye, he has. And that's a devilish plot. Guy has a bitter, twisted sense of humor, gentlemen. Even when he's planning as dastardly a thing as a murder. I am James Stewart. He is Guy Falkenby, which is near enough to Guy Fox. Today is the 5th of November, and he's planning to blow me up. <laughs> oh, come, sir, come, come. You can't expect us to believe that, but it's oh, true. Oh, he warned me, uh, and the celebrations that are going on in the streets of London today would make a rare cloak for his activities. I must confess, Mr. Stewart, that I find your story most unconvincing. All your evidence appears to depend on conversations held between you and this cousin of yours. You have no facts to substantiate your claim. But I have. Then please, let's hear them. I live at 23 Cavendish Square. A week ago, the house next door to me was let to a new tenant. Almost immediately, workmen became very active there. They were digging in the cellars, Mr. Holmes. I could hear the sounds of picks and shovels through the walls. Digging in the cellar? That sounds significant, doesn't it, Holmes? Dreamly, did you observe any other activities of the workmen, Mr. Stewart? Aye, Mr. Holmes. Vans have been delivering large packing cases to the basement during the last two days. I know what's in them, too. It's gunpowder. I tell you, they're planning to blow me up today. No, 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 no. <laughs> steady, sir, steady, steady. You mustn't excite yourself again. What shall I do, Mr. Holmes? I think, sir, it would be better for you to rest here for a while and then go to a nearby hotel, I would suggest, with sharp spray. And wait there until you hear from us. And where are you gentlemen going? Watson and I, after donning suitable disguises, will visit the house adjoining yours in Cavendish Square. I think an examination of the cellar there might prove most illuminating. Yes, 
This must be the house, all right, Holmes. The empty packing cases are still by the foot of the basement steps. Come on, Watson, let's go down and explore. Upon my soul, I feel a little self-conscious in these clothes. You don't need to, my dear Jeff. You look the most authentic inspector of plumbing. <laughs> if anyone challenges us, you'd better let me do the talking, though. I think my accent might be a little more convincing. Shh. Listen. I can't hear anything. Exactly. We may reasonably assume that either the workmen are observing the Guy Fawkes holiday or that their work is done. Let's try this door. It's unlocked. Yes. Well, this is too easy, Watson. We must be prepared for a trap. Come on. I've got my revolver handy if there's, if there's any trouble. Don't use it unless I tell you to. Remember, we are we're supposed to be plumbing inspectors. Maybe full of gunpowder. Take the risk, old chap. Here's a gas jet. I'll light it. Uh, that's better. Now we can see a little. Uh -huh. I think the workmen have completed their job. See that new wood on the crude door in the corner over there? Now, where does it lead to? You Let's find out. Also unlocked. There's a lantern waiting conveniently for us on this ledge. Ooh, this is ridiculously easy. Now I'm sure it's a trap. I like the lantern. Quite Scott. Tunnel. Yes, a tunnel leading towards Mr. Stewart's house next door. Let's explore it. Holmes, look. Look at the barrels. I bet they're full of gunpowder. Undoubtedly. You've observed the fuses as well. Yes, the complete equipment for another gunpowder plot. I can't believe my eyes. What a fantastic plan. But how could the murderer be certain that Stuart would be killed in the explosion? I think that's easily answered, Watson. Remember Mr. Stuart's bad heart in his present state of apprehension? An exploding firecracker would be enough to kill him. I suppose so. Well, what's this lying on the floor? It's curious. The funniest strip of silk. A little ring on one Let me see it, Watson. Uh-huh. Yeah. By Jove, I believe it's a Jess. A Jess? But no, sir. Last piece of evidence necessary to confirm the conclusion. Come out of there! I think your hands above your head! I've got a revolver! Right, you Governor. We ain't doing no harm. Now remember what I'm doing the talking. Come on. Out you come. <laughs> well, you're a comical looking pair. What were you doing in there? Uh, me and my mate got a message to come here and look over the plumbing, mister. Plumbers, eh? Do you have any identification? Uh, yes, sir. Here's my badge. We're inspectors for the London County Council. Oh, that's all right, my man. I saw the basement door open and I thought burglars might be here. You the owner of this house, sir? Yes. But my agent let it recently to some tenants who've been behaving rather queerly, I'm told. So I came round here to see what was happening. If you're the owner, sir, perhaps you'd uh, give me some facts for me records. I've got to fill in my records, you know. What do you want to know? Well, your name, please, sir. Falkenberg. Guy Falkenberg. Look, uh, help it. Hold your nose. What did he say? Uh, nothing, sir. He's got his cups. He's had a bad case of them. Haven't been able to stop him for months. <laughs> Alfie, here. Give me a pencil. <laughs> and now, sir, your name is uh, Guy Falkenberg. What's the name of the tenants uh, this house is let to? Well, three of them. Uh, you know their names, sir? Got to have them for me records, you know. Yes, the names are Winter, Ropewood, and Kane. Uh, 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 Winter... Rokewood and Keynes, right, sir? <laughs> Sounds as if they might be a firm of solicitors, don't they, sir? Well, oh, perhaps they are. I haven't met them. Oh, just one more question, sir, and then I'll even bother you no more. Oh, what is it, my religion or, or my grandmother's maiden name? <laughs> no, sir, nothing like that. I just wondered who's living in the house next door on that side. We've had a complaint from there, too. Their pipes is bunged up. Well, my cousin lives there. His name's James Stewart. Uh, Mr. James Stewart. Much obliged, sir. Me and my mate will be going next door now. Come on, Alfie. I'm not surprised his pipes are bunged up, as you so graphically put it. He's a great one for practical jokes about the house. As a matter of fact, he's planning one of them tonight. Oh, well, that's no concern of yours. By the way, my man, what's your name? Nivet, sir. Tom Nivet. Go on, Alfie. We've got work to do. <laughs> Holmes, I wish you'd tell me what's going on. 
why we take this cab back to Lake Street. To get out of these clothes. They serve their purpose, and there's more serious work afoot. Well, I'm confused about our interview with Guy Falkenberg. Why did you say your name was Tom Nivett? Oh, a touch of vanity, old fellow. Vanity? How do you mean? Consider the names in this case so far, Watson. James Stewart says that he's been threatened by Guy Falkenberg, a name, as Mr. Stewart points out, not unlike Guy Fawkes. You recall the names of the three tenants that Mr. Falkenberg gave us a few minutes ago? Yes. Winter, Rokewood, and Kane. What's that got to do with it? A great deal. Thomas Burr, Ambrose Rokewood, and Robert Keynes were the three men executed with Guy Fox in the original gunpowder plot in 1605. Good Lord, but where does Tom Nivett, the name you gave yourself, fit into the picture? Thomas Nivett was the Westminster magistrate who arrested the conspirators. Since the would-be murderer has such an academic knowledge of the original plot, I thought I'd let him know that he was up against an opponent worthy of his steel. <laughs> We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Just about time for me to remind you that if you want a wine that's sure to please the ladies, you can't miss with Petri California Muscatel. That's because Petri Muscatel is a golden wine with one of the most luscious flavors you ever tasted. Did you ever taste a big, plump Muscat grape that's ripened in the sun? If you have, then you know what to expect when you taste Petri Muscatel. That's a wonderful wine. Perfect after dinner and swell when company comes. Just remember that, won't you? Petri Muscatel. Well, Doctor, you and Mr. Holmes were certainly having yourselves quite a Guy Fawkes day. What happened when you got back to Baker Street? We quickly changed out of our disguises and back into our ordinary clothes. I was still pretty much in the dark, as usual. And I kept questioning Holmes as to our next move. He was in a state of suppressed excitement. And it was obvious as he spoke to me that he was anxious to be off. No dawdle. No, so much work ahead of us. Dawdle, no, no, I'm not dawdling. Because as far as I can. What's our next move, anyhow? we have split forces. I must get hold of my band of street urchins, the Baker Street Irregulars. I'm going to surround Mr. Stewart's house in Cavendish Square, and they'll be invaluable for such purpose. What do you want me to do? Go to the Shaftesbury Hotel and collect Mr. Stewart, then return with him to his house and wait me there. I shall join you as soon as I've rounded up the irregulars, but I must warn you, don't leave Mr. Stewart for a moment. Don't let him out of your sight until you see me again. Well, of course I won't, Holmes, but uh, oh, I must say, the idea of all that gunpowder in the cellar doesn't make me feel any oh, have good. Oh, have faith in me, have in me. What? You know, I wouldn't expose you to any danger if I could avoid it. Oh, and I oh. assure you that I shall join you and Mr. Stewart very shortly. You have your revolver? Yes, of course. Good. And uh, give Mr. Stewart this revolver, will you? Tell him that I insist that he carries it. I fear that his own has probably been tampered with. Oh, not sure, Holmes. I'll see that he has it. This is a strange business, I must say. That guy Falkenberg seems such a decent sort of fellow. Yes, he appeared to be a most amiable man, didn't he? This is indeed an unusual case, Watson. We're up against one of the most sinister and twisted antagonists that we've ever met. Well, old chap, I'm leaving now. I'll join you soon. And don't forget, stay close to Mr. Stewart. Stay very close to him. I wish your friend were here. No, no, don't get so excited, Mr. Stewart. He'll be here any moment now. You, uh, you still got the revolver that I gave you? Uh, yes, uh, it's in my pocket. But what's the good of a revolver if there should be an explosion? Answer me that if you can. Well, you must have faith in Mr. Holmes, sir. He's arranging now to have this house of yours surrounded by his band of street urchins. They'll see that no one gets to the cellar next door... To light the fuses. Ah, a bunch of children. How can they do anything? Uh, how can they do anything? You, you, you don't know the Baker Street Irregulars, Mr. Stewart. And it's a perfect day for them to operate. There's black-faced boys begging for pennies. They'd pass unnoticed anywhere. I hope you're right. But I have a premonition, Doctor. There's going to be a tragedy. I know no, it. No, 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 sir. Take it easy. Take it easy. Remember your heart. You're in splendid hands when Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Here he is now. Holmes, I must say, I'm, I'm glad to see you. Have you received your visitor yet? Visitor? We've seen no one. Then be on the alert. 
I've just been questioning the boys surrounding this house. A few moments ago, some children pulled a small cart up to the back door, a cart containing a life-size dummy. My irregulars thought it was an effigy on its way to a bonfire. Well, why shouldn't it be? I have a reason to believe that it's uh, someone visiting you in disguise, Mr. Stewart. A visitor who is mounting the back stairs at this very moment. You've got to stand by me, Holmes. You've got to protect me. Don't worry, sir. I... Come in. Look. Look at that apparition. Wait, Scott. A guy Fawkes dummy. A dark lantern in his hand and it's talking. And also talking, I trust. Keep away from me. I've got a revolver. Take the face of Victoria's face if you won't give me one or take two. The better for me and the worse for you. It's Guy Falkenberg. Keep away from me, do you hear? The better for me and the worse for you. All right, then. I'm, I'm going to fire. <coughs> Jimmy, Mr. Stewart, the revolver I provided you with seems to be unloaded. How very odd. What in thunder is all this about? You have just witnessed an attempted murder, Watson. Murder? What are you talking about? This is a game. James, James and I had arranged the whole thing. You may have thought it was a game, Mr. Falkenberg, but I assure you that your cousin... Grab him, Watson. Look, he seems to be leaving us. <coughs> Leave me alone. Take your hands off me. Uh, 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 Bahak. Help, help me put him on the sofa. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, I'll get him some digitalis. I don't want to appear unnecessarily stupid, but will someone tell me what this is all about? Your pleasure, Mr. Falkenby. Your cousin had planned one of the most fantastic murder plots that I've ever encountered. He came to us for the story that you had threatened his life. But that's ridiculous. I'm very fond of it. Of course it's ridiculous. The whole plot is quite ridiculous. He leased the house next door... Had a tunnel dug and gunpowder and fuses planted there. He even entered the name of the tenants as Winter, Rokewood, and Keynes to give the apparent plot a further authenticity. You mean my cousin was the real tenant? Certainly. However, he was clumsy enough to drop that piece of silk with the wire ring on the end that you found in the cellar, Watson. The thing you call a jest. And what's the jest? It's a strap that goes round the falcon's leg to which its leash is fastened. You will remember that Mr. Stewart informed us that falconry is his hobby. And it therefore indicated that he had been in the cellar and consequently must have known about the whole plot. And all he was trying to do was to build up in our minds the belief that his cousin was trying to kill him. Exactly, my dear fellow. Had we believed him, of course he could have shot you just now, Mr. Falkenby, in apparent self-defense. Good Lord, what a fantastic plot. I, I still can't quite believe Mr. it. Mr. Falkenby, why are you dressed as a Guy Fawkes dummy? Well, it was James' idea. He said that he was going to dress up too and that we'd go around the bonfires tonight and frighten people by appearing as live dummies. But uh, the last message he sent told me to come here, that we'd play a practical joke on a couple of friends of Did his. he provide the costume you're wearing? Yes, as a matter of fact, he did. Have you searched the pockets for any weapons? No, but I will. And while you're doing that, I'll examine this dark lantern. How's the patient, Watson? Well, I've given him some digitalis. Now I'll get him some brand. I can't find anything in the pockets. Here's the answer. Look here. Inside the lantern is a dagger. Your cousin planted it there to substantiate the claim that you were trying to kill him. Had his plans worked, you would have been dead, Mr. Falkenby, before you could have told the truth. Here! Come back here, Mr. Stewart! James! He slipped out of the door. Found it! He was faking that heart attack. Come on, Watson. Now, sir. Please. Oh, Ronnie, here comes the Lord Mayor of London, chum. Please excuse me, I'm trying to find a friend of mine. It's most important. Holmes! Holmes, where are you? Here I am, what's up? I hear you. Come on, <laughs> Out of the way, please. I'm coming, Holmes. Get in the car. You, you got away from me in the crowd. I'm afraid this church got away from us. Well, we'll never find him in this crowd. He's a dangerous man. There's no knowing what he might do. Where are the irregulars? Ah, there's Wiggins. Uh, Wiggins! Hello, Mr. Elms. Dr. Watson. Wiggins, did you see a man run out of that house a few minutes ago? No, Governor. Grab Charlie did. Hey, Charlie, come over here. It's Mr. Elms. All right. I bet Charlie didn't see anything, though. He's got some sobby girl with him. Hello, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Hello, Charlie. Hello. Did you see a man run through this crowd a few minutes ago, a tallish man with a gray mustache? Yes, I did. A man came running out of the house over there. That's the house. Where'd he go? The man down toward the shop. And he threw a lot of he did. The one we were going to burn him a bonfire. I tried to stop him, but he got away. Holmes, Holmes, look up there on the roof. There's a figure. By Jove, I believe it's James Stewart. That's the man. He's the one that stole our dummy. He's standing up on the roof. He's going to jump. If he does, he's going to land in the bonfire. There he goes. He is jumping. Right in the middle of the fire. It's awful. 
he'll be burned That's off. Hurry, Wiggins. That wasn't a man who fell into the bonfire. What do you mean? From the gyrations that the figure performed as it fell, I'm convinced that Mr. Stewart threw the stolen dummy to try and put us off the track. Then Stewart's still up there. He is, Watson. Come along, old boy. It's up onto the rooftops for us. Up onto the rooftops. <laughs> Comprehensive case, Watson. It starts in a cellar and ends on a rooftop. Look, Holmes. By the parapet there. Crumpled body, Mr. Stewart. Looks to me as if he's... Yes, he's... Dead, Holmes. Well, it's not surprising. The effort of carrying the dummy up here and throwing it, combined with his own state of excitement, is too much for him. Well, quite frankly, I can't say that I'm sorry. No, indeed. He planned a murder, and if it hadn't been for you, he would have succeeded. An extraordinary case, Holmes. Yes, old chap. One that should long make us remember the 5th of November. By Jove, yes. Please to remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason, and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder, treason, should ever be forgot. <laughs> Doctor, uh, as you boys would say, that story was a bit of exciting, what? Yes, yes, yes. And even now, I sort of uh, lose my breath almost when I when I remember climbing that uh, that fire escape. <laughs> you know, Doctor, it, it seems to me that those two fellows certainly went out of their way to celebrate Guy Fawkes Day. I mean, well, now, now take me. When when I've got a little celebrating to do, I like to do it quietly. Friends, a glass of port. Petri port, of course. What else? Oh, leave it to you. No matter what the occasion is, you can somehow make it the perfect occasion for Petri wine. How, how do you do it? <laughs> Don't ask me how I do it. <laughs> you mean, how does the Petri family do it? How can they make such swell wine? Well, the answer is experience. The Petri family has been making fine wine for generations. And ever since they first established the Petri business way back in the 1800s, They've handed on down from father to son, from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's why when you want a wine for any occasion, before dinner, with your meals, or after dinner, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Now, Dr. Watson, what Sherlock Holmes adventure are you going to tell us next week? An old favorite, Mr. Bartell, a story that concerns strange music that was heard in a lonely house in the English countryside, and of the living death that stalked there. I call it The Adventure of the Speckled Bear. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Music was by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. <laughs>